What? Danish? I thought it was 100% African. Oh, that's weird. Wait, are you telling me that Denmark, they had a colony in the West Indies for 250 years? Oh my god. I thought the Scandies didn't do slavery. Hi, I'm Dexter, and welcome to my channel, where I discuss all things Caribbean history and genealogy. I'm a born and raised Virgin Islander with roots there going back nearly 300 years. And while researching my family history, I quickly realized that the history of these islands, it's far more complex and much more interesting than I ever could have imagined. In this video, I'll introduce you to the history of the Virgin Islands and explain why I think it's such a fascinating place. But before I jump into that, hit that subscribe button. So where are the Virgin Islands? They are located in the Northeast Caribbean in the Leeward Islands. You've probably heard of the British and US Virgin Islands, but you may be less familiar with Vieques or Culebra, which are part of the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. These islands changed hands multiple times between not just one, two, or three, but five different European nations. The Virgin Islands group begins on the immediate east coast of Puerto Rico, and that's the island of Vieques, which was also known as Crab Island, and extends to the northeast to the island of Anegada. Except for the flat coral island of Anegada, the terrain is mainly hilly, and there are no rivers, and there's a limited supply of fresh water. So this made them very unattractive for permanent settlement. However, there were people living there. These were the indigenous people, the Taino people. Now these are descendants of people that sailed from the northern bit of South America on large canoes or longboats. The indigenous people of the Virgin Islands had their first contact with Europeans in 1493 on Christopher Columbus's second journey to the New World. The islands were so numerous and beautiful, it's said that Columbus named them in honour of St Ursula and her 11,000 martyred maidens, who were all killed on their pilgrimage to Rome. Unfortunately, the indigenous people of the Virgin Islands suffered a fate similar to St Ursula, and they were almost completely exterminated. Archaeological evidence of these indigenous peoples remain on the island and traces of their DNA are still found in people living there today. In the 16th century, the Virgin Islands were a very dangerous place as they were a hotbed for piracy. Sir Francis Drake sailed through the islands in 1585 and he used a channel in between the islands to evade detection after attacking and plundering Spanish ships. You see, Drake acted as a privateer on the royal charter to steal gold and enslave persons or whatever else they could get from Spanish ships in the West Indies to benefit the purse of his queen, Elizabeth I. Two years later, the Virgin Islands were described by the Earl of Cumberland as, and I quote, a knot of tiny islands wholly uninhabited, sandy, barren, and craggy. Spain focused their efforts on colonizing the larger islands, so Cuba, Hispaniola, Jamaica, and Puerto Rico. Most of the islands that would become the modern-day British Virgin Islands were included in a land grant to the Earl of Carlisle in 1627. However, he decided to focus his efforts on the more profitable island of Barbados. Now, I made a video about, about Barbados, can have a look it's up there somewhere click on that and you'll learn how Barbados became Britain's first slave society so now while all of that was happening many other European nations they saw an opportunity and took some interest in these largely ignored and pirate infested islands of the Virgin Islands so in 1648 you've got the Dutch a group of well buccaneers I don't know if they're pirates or I don't know is a buccaneer worse than a pirate or better, I don't know, somebody tell me in the comments. But these buccaneers, they were essentially 
squatting on the island of Tortola and they built a fort there to guard against enemy activity. The Dutch also set up a trading post on the island in the northeast Caribbean of St. Eustatius. Now the interesting thing about St. Eustatius is that they were actually Sephardic Jews that were fleeing persecution in Europe in the 1660s that found themselves in the West Indies on St. Eustatius and they are the ones that actually brought the trade to the island. Now seeing that starting to pay some dividends, the Danish then decided that yes, they're going to get in on it as well and they set up shop on the island of St. Thomas or St. Thomas in 1670. Now they fashioned this as a transshipment port where ships they could be provisioned or repaired or they would be able to load their ships up with slave produced goods from the West Indies that were en route to markets in Europe. They also had a large and very busy slave market on St. Thomas. Meanwhile, the island of St. Croix in the south of the Virgin Islands, it changed hands multiple times. In 1625, the English and Dutch, they colonized the island. Um, there had previously been indigenous people that the Spanish had turfed off. They saw an opportunity to start agriculture on the island. Then, by 1650, the French got involved via the Knights of Malta and later Louis XIV's French West India Company. They took control of the island and there are some advantages to this island that the French really liked in that it was relatively larger than the others, there was more flat land and you could have a much higher yield of sugar for this reason. Now, if that's not confusing enough, the English still laid claim on the majority of the islands based on that previous grant to the Earl of Carlisle, but they didn't really take much notice of the islands because they were small and you couldn't scale things as much as you could in a Nevis or a Barbados, so they didn't really pay much attention to it until the Danish and the Dutch started having very lucrative trade at their transshipment and free ports. So the English launched a number of disputes. Uh, reading the diplomatic letters, it's it's hilarious actually, <laughs> where this is like you'd have like one diplomat writing to another and insulting them and then another saying, how dare you insult me? This island is rightfully mine. How could you do that? But it's my island. No, it's my island. No, those are my enslaved people. Why did the Spanish entice those enslaved people away? But anyway, the English eventually, they captured uh, and annexed Tortola formally away from the Dutch in 1672 and they turfed them off the island. But they also just didn't think it was a viable colony, so they moved all of the British people from Tortola over to St. Christopher, or also known as St. Kitts now. This was then followed by the start of a more permanent settlement of English planters that came from Anguilla. And by about 1680, Tortola and Spanish Town, which is now Virgin Gorda, they had a deputy governor and they had a council of six. So what a curious bunch here. We've got Dutch, English, French and Danish colonists and as well as traders and enslaved people living on these islands. But you also had Spanish ships intermittently coming in from Puerto Rico and just sacking the towns or pirates coming in and attacking the settlements on the islands. So the islands became notorious for piracy and for lawlessness and the islands intermittently became abandoned for this reason. This caused great fear across the West Indies of the Virgin Islands and it really made them extremely unattractive for anyone to want to be there permanently. Therefore, these islands were the last to be colonized by Europeans, and particularly the island of Tortola. After the Acts of Union between England and Scotland in 1707, we then see an influx of Scots coming into the West Indies to settle the islands. However, this did not stop the Danes from coming in and just taking the island of St. John. So they were like, well, you know, England, you're not really using it. And so a couple of our farmers thought that they could 
just go on there with some enslaved people and uh, you know, start a plantation. And before you know it, it was under the crown of Denmark. That was another diplomatic row, but effectively the admiralty of the British Navy, they were more interested in protecting the more lucrative islands to the east. And no matter how many times the Council of the Virgin Islands wrote asking for protection, they were ignored. So, you know, these things happen. Then in 1733, the French sold St. Croix to the Danes because the French, they wanted to focus their attention on the massively lucrative colony of Saint-Domingue, now Haiti. And we all know how that ended. Anyway, this is how the Danks West Indian or Danish West Indies came to be. So you can imagine this was a very dynamic place with a lot going on, a lot of drama. We bring the drama, it seems. Uh, and within that mix of things, we then now have the addition of Quakers and non-conformist Protestants who were also, well, they also owned slaves and they also did a few things that were a bit dodgy. But they also did some good things, particularly in educating the enslaved population and they well converted them to Christianity while they were teaching them how to read and write. Fast forward from the 18th century to the end of the 19th century. In 1898, we have the Spanish-American War where the United States invade Puerto Rico in the summer and they take the island and it all goes pear-shaped and Spain decides that in the next year that they will cede that island of Puerto Rico and Vieques and Culebra, which are part of the what they would call the Spanish Virgin Islands, to the United States. However, the US was only interested in having strategic positioning to their interests in Panama. The people that inhabited the island of Vieques, most of them, they were removed from the island and that island was used for decades to detonate bombs and to test US military weapons on the island. That went on until 2003 and now a large portion of that island it's uninhabited and it's contaminated and who knows when anyone will ever be able to live there again. So after the US acquired Puerto Rico and the, the, the island surrounding, in 1917 the Danes they were short on cash and they did a referendum and got consent to sell the Danish West Indies to the United States for a sum of $25 million. And this ended nearly 250 years of their colonial history in the West Indies. And these islands became the US Virgin Islands as we know them today. Now, last but not least, the remaining Virgin Islands, which were the only ones that really originally had the styling of the Virgin Islands colony, where I come from. Now, those islands, they're still under the crown and they're classified as uh, overseas territories of the United Kingdom. So the story of colonialism in the Caribbean at large, it's very complex, but the Virgin Islands, I think it's a special case. So many different things happening, islands changing hands, we have plots and subplots happening within it, and so it's it's a very fascinating place. We're very lucky in that the records for the Danks Vestindin in the Danish archives, those have been all digitized and they're available on Family Search and on Ancestry. So we've got census records and birth records, marriages, so many records. It's it's fantastic on top of the British records and the records in, in Puerto Rico. A lot of those are in ch church records. So for this reason, if you've got any links to the Virgin Islands, be prepared to have records in multiple languages and yeah, you need to get a friend that speaks Danish. Like I'm looking for one right now. Message me in the comments <laughs> if you <laughs> help me uh, decipher some documents. And just keep an open mind because your ancestors, they could literally come from anywhere. 
Thanks for watching and if you enjoyed this video, give me a thumbs up by hitting the like button. It really helps others find my content. Don't forget to subscribe and check out my video on Caribbean ancestry myths. See you on the next one.